Charles Darwin is easily one of the most recognizable and iconic figures in the history of science. To combatants in the culture wars, he's either a kind of scientific saint or the embodiment of evil. And everyone on both sides knows he's the guy who invented the theory of evolution when he published On the Origin of Species in 1859. Only, he's not. The idea of evolution predates Darwin by a mile. His own grandfather was writing poems praising evolutionary ideas in the 1790s. And Jean-Baptiste Lamarck had a worked out theory of evolution right around the time that Charles Darwin was born. He's not even the first evolutionist to hit the bestseller list. That was done by a sensationalist book called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation that was published in the 1840s. So why do we remember Charles Darwin as the father of evolution when these other writers are basically forgotten? The answer is surprisingly ordinary. It all comes down to stamp collecting. Okay, not literally stamps, but stamp collecting is a convenient stand-in for collecting hobbies in general, the amassing of many varieties of a particular class of object. People collect all sorts of things, trading cards, books, china bells, art and antiques. Almost everyone has at some time been a collector of something, even if it's just a bunch of interesting looking rocks found in the driveway. Charles Darwin was a great collector of observations of the natural world. As a young man, he signed on to the voyage of the HMS Beagle and spent five years sailing up and down the coast of South America, collecting plants and animals, rocks and fossils. After this trip, he returned to England and spent the next 20 years living on a country estate where he was breeding pigeons, dissecting barnacles, and discussing the natural world with fellow scientists and his rural neighbors. He amassed a great collection of observations of the natural world and studied the patterns that emerged when he pieced all this information together. When it came time to write his own book about evolution then, Darwin had an enormous advantage. Earlier writers relied very heavily on sort of metaphysical speculation, but Darwin brought data, mountains of it. In the first chapter of The Origin alone, he cites observations made on ducks, cows, goats, cats, sheep, pigs, dogs, cattle, donkeys, guinea fowl, reindeer, camels, rabbits, ferrets, horses, geese, and peacocks. He also cites at least 24 other writers, ranging from fellow scientists to noted animal breeders to the Roman writer Pliny and even the book of Genesis. All of this while regularly apologizing that a single book doesn't provide him sufficient space to go into as much detail as he would like. None of these individual observations are convincing by themselves, but all of them together make an overwhelming case in favor of evolution. Earlier thinkers had the idea of evolution, but Darwin had data and used it to present a rigorous, complete theory that passed scientific muster. In the intervening 150 years, the case for evolution has only gotten stronger. The evidence for evolution is absolutely overwhelming, and Darwin's status as an icon of science is secure and well-deserved. The story of Darwin's collecting is useful because it provides a counterexample to one of the most pernicious myths out there about science. In the popular imagination, people think of scientists as, a, as an elite, people who are possessed of skills that ordinary folks just don't have. Only nerds with enormous brains can do science. Right? But that's not true. Science isn't a set of esoteric skills. Science is a process for figuring out how the world works. You look at the world around you. You think about why it might work that way. You test your theory with experiments and observations. And when you have a theory that works, you tell everyone you know the results. This is a process that we use all the time, even in the pursuit of everyday hobbies, as simple as collecting objects. The same skills that make a good collector, the ability to discern the tiny differences that set a valuable stamp apart from a worthless piece of colored paper, those skills lie at the heart of some of the greatest discoveries in the history of science. Around 1900, the British physicist Ernest Rutherford famously declared that all of science is either physics or stamp collecting. This is generally held up as an example of either the inferiority of biologists or the arrogance of physicists, depending on whether you're a physicist or a biologist. But maybe, given the essential role that collecting has played in the history of science, maybe we should turn this around and regard it instead as a great complement to stamp collecting.